Praise the Lord, everybody. Um, If you have your Bible, would you take it on out? If you need a Bible, raise your hands. Want to welcome all of our locations that are tuning in, our online and our television audience and our social media audience. We're glad everybody is here to hear a word from God. Also want to welcome, you saw we sang a little bit in Spanish, a little bit in Portuguese. Welcome all of the campuses that are represented here from those particular areas of worship. We're glad you're here as well. Let's take our Bibles and hold them up nice and high and let's make this declaration of our faith all together. Ready, go. This is my Bible. It is my primary source of spiritual nourishment. I will read it every day and become all that God wants me to be. My mind will be renewed. My life will be transformed. I will become fully surrendered to Christ. Therefore, I will hide his word in my heart so I can be all God has destined me to be. Amen and amen. Would you remain standing in honor of God's word? We are going to Matthew chapter number 18. Matthew chapter number 18. And we are looking at the parables of Jesus. We are calling them, as they are appropriately called, the greatest stories ever told. Jesus was a master storyteller. He was the best of the best. He knew how to speak to people in such a way that would arrest the hearts of people, would disarm them, and it would get right to their heart. And that's what parables are. Matthew chapter number 18, beginning in verse 21, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall I, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one who was brought to him owed him 10,000 talents. But he was not able to pay, and his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. You know, we ought to be very grateful that God doesn't demand that we pay for every debt that we have. Can I tell you what? We won't want that kind of life. Yet, that's the kind of way that we treat one another, isn't it? Somebody does us wrong, we're like, they need to pay. We see it in our public discourse. They need to pay. They need to pay. We better be grateful that we don't treat, that God doesn't treat us like we treat others. Amen? The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe me. And so his fellow servant fell down at his feet. He begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. And so when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very grieved and they came and told their master all that had been done. Then the master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. What an amazing parable. I want to minister to you from this story. Take the limits off. Take the limits off. We have these limits to where we'll go and where we'll allow ourselves to forgive. And at certain points in our life, we are just canceling people and writing people off. But can I just encourage you today, take the limits off off. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, which is ministered by the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for grace to every listener so that they can really receive everything that you have in Jesus' name. And everybody said, you may be seated. One of the shocking realities of scripture is that there are certain things that we as finite human beings can choose to do that God, that by God's own sovereign will and choice can limit an infinite God. There are certain things that we as finite human beings by God's own sovereign will and choice can limit a limitless God. For instance, in Mark chapter number six, verse number five, it says that Jesus could not 
do many mighty works, save lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And the reason was because of their unbelief. Unbelief is something that you and I as finite human beings can express that causes us to limit a limitless God. Disobedience causes us to limit a limitless God. Psalm 78 verse 41. Yes, again and again they tempted God, and watch this, and limited the Holy One of Israel. Lack of prayer can limit a limitless God. Ezekiel chapter 22 verse number 30 says, I sought for a man among them that would make up a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Lack of prayer can limit a limitless God. Jesus in fact said, or the book of James says, you have not because you ask not. Lack of prayer can limit a limitless God. Choice can limit a limitless God. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse number 19, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. To be clear, our ability to limit God is only possible because of God's adherence to his sovereign will and word, and not because we have greater power than God in any way, shape, or form. But there are things that we can express because of the way God has designed our operation and interaction with him and the way the world is governed that can limit a limitless God. I want to focus on one of those things that certainly can do that. And that is this big thing called unforgiveness. It's with that thought in mind that I want to minister to you from this subject, take the limits off. That is the way that the parable ends, isn't it? So my heavenly Father will also do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brothers his trespasses by unforgiving or by practicing unforgiveness, we are limiting a limitless God. And this is really the whole point of the parable, to take the limits off. Peter knew that forgiveness was Jesus' thing, right? You couldn't, you couldn't hang around Jesus and not know that forgiveness was his thing, which kind of begs the question, are you hanging around Jesus? Because people that are always angry at everybody, people that are always looking to get other people, people that are always looking to cancel other people, my question is, are you really hanging around Jesus? Because was that the behavior of Jesus? You could not hang around Jesus and not know that he was one of the most forgiving people that you will ever get around. And Peter saw, Peter got a firsthand look. He watched as he dealt with the woman caught in adultery. He was shocked by that. He watched how he had a relationship with the town prostitute, you know, Mary. He watched that. He watched how he treated Zacchaeus, the tax collector. He watched not only as he treated them with forgiveness, but he actually ate with them. He actually offered them peace, and he offered them community. And so Pete was hanging around Jesus, and, and he was like, Jesus, this forgiveness thing, it's starting to rub off on me. And so I'm wondering, Jesus, I've made this decision in my life to kind of be a little bit more like you, and I've decided I am going to up my forgiveness quotient from three to seven. What do you think about that, Jesus? Pete's got his chest out, his arms broken from patting himself on the back, you know. He's thinking he's really doing this amazing thing. He's going to go from three, that was the cultural norm, by the way. Rabbis taught that you had to forgive your brother three times if they sinned against you. But if they sin more than three times against you, you could treat them like an enemy. And so that's where we get the three strikes and you're out thing. And so here is Pete. He's hanging around Jesus. And he's like, ah, you have changed my life, Jesus. I mean, you have, you have caused my forgiveness quotient to be elevated. I'm willing to go from three, Jesus. That's what everybody else does. I'm going to be a seven times forgiving person. And, and Pete, he's, he's fishing for a compliment. He's looking for some brownie points with Jesus. And don't look at Pete in that tone of voice like you never looked for brownie points with Jesus. I mean, we are still performing for, for God's acceptance instead of resting in our salvation, aren't we? We still think that if we do this and we do that and we do this and we do that and we do this and we do that, that God is somehow going to accept us more or love us more because we don't understand grace. And so we are a little bit like Pete. We are fishing from compl for compliments from Jesus. Kind of like the Geico commercial. You ever see that? When, when Honest Abe's wife comes walking out. You ever see that one? And she's wearing a new dress. And she says, she says to Honest Abe, does this dress make me look fat? 
I mean, he's honest, right? He can't tell a lie. And honest Dave, he doesn't kind of know what to do. And he goes, like that. Come on, honest Dave. She's just looking for some validation. She's just looking for, she looks her best in the moment. She was fishing for a compliment. Pete is fishing for a compliment. And so Jesus doesn't answer Pete the way that Pete expects. Pete expects to hear this from Jesus. Wow, Pete, I have really rubbed off on you. But instead, what Jesus says is, Pete, I haven't rubbed off on you as much as you think. You think this is still about keeping score. You think this is still about tit for tat. You think this is somehow about justifiable uh, retaliation. Pete, you think this is about limits, but I haven't come to raise the limits. I've come to change the lifestyle. I haven't come to, to, to alter the system, to, to, just, to just tweak the system. I've come to alter the system. This is no longer about keeping score. This is no longer about if you do it to me, I have a right to do it to you. This is a whole new operating system for what the Christian life should look like. This is forgiveness on a whole nother level. This is Pete 70 times 7 forgiveness. And see, to the Jewish mind, they understood what this meant. To us, we're like, hmm, why, why did you pick that up? This doesn't make any sense. The Jewish people understood that time was, breaking, was broken up into seven 70-year periods of time. And then they believe after those seven 70-year periods of time were over, Daniel chapter 9, that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And so what Jesus was actually saying to the Jewish mind that was thinking that forgiveness has limits of only three is you don't forgive three times, you forgive till the end of time. You just keep on forgiving and keep on forgiving and keep on forgiving. And now Pete's mind is like on tilt. <laughs> By the way, I, I kind of think that if you... If you never get your mind blown by God again, you might not be hanging around the right Jesus because he will blow your mind. And so Pete encounters the first thing that the parable, the first truth that the parable teaches, and that is the problem of forgiveness. The problem of forgiveness is it's hard. It, it's not easy. It's the opposite of our initial reaction. Our initial reaction is payback. Our initial reaction is get back. Our initial reaction is to be mad and stay mad, to punish, to shame, and nowadays to cancel. Unforgiveness is easy. It's easy to lash out. It's easy to pay back. It's easy to shame. It's easy to justify. Matter of fact, forgiveness is what I would call a narrow way virtue and unforgiveness is, uh, I'm sorry, the other way is, is a Broadway virtue. Forgiveness is a narrow way virtue, and unforgiveness is a Broadway virtue. You remember what Jesus said? He said, he said, he said this in Matthew chapter 7, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. In other words, it's easy to be an unforgiving person. It's easy to go tip for tat. It, there's nothing special about that. And many go in by it. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And if you find it, it's hard to exercise forgiveness. And this is the first part of the parable that Jesus is teaching Peter. And here's what he said. He said, this guy owes this king 10,000 talents. Now you have to understand what, what this meant to the Jewish ear. 10,000 was the largest number they had. 10,000 Talents. This was the biggest uh, denomination of money that Jesus could actually pick. He is shocking them by saying 10,000. I also think he's telling them that forgiveness is a test. Because 10 is the number of testing in the Bible, right? And so he said 10,000 talents. Now, to put it in perspective, the whole uh, income or revenue of King Herod the Great's kingdom was 900 talents, in Bible times. This 11 times the, the whole income of King Herod the Great's entire kingdom. And Jesus said this is, this is so much money. This is beyond what anything. So this servant is probably like the minister of, the, of, of finance of the, of the kingdom of this king. And this sum is, is so huge. It's so big. And he goes before the king and he says to the king, you know what? I need you to forgive me of this. Now you have to understand this amount of money, this mistake would jeopardize 
the, the, the financial or the economy of his kingdom. This was an egregious mistake. It would take time. It would take all of that. And he says, I, I need you to give me some more time to pay this back. Now, the normal way, and by the way, you could never pay it back, not in a million lifetimes, right? By the way, you know, you know when it comes to forgiveness and unforgiveness, you can't pay it back. You can't unscramble eggs, right? It, once, once you harm somebody, you, you, you can't take it away. You've already harmed them. The, the, the damage has been done. And so he says, you just give me a little bit more time. Now, the normal way of handling this in Bible times is that the guy would be, would be put into slavery his family, his wife, and his children would be sold. Everything he had would be sold, and that's how he would pay it back. And so he pleads with the guy. He says, listen, please, please, just give me some more time. And to his shock, to his shock, the king doesn't give him more time. He completely discharges the debt. No strings attached. And when we listen to this, our first reaction is, oh, my God. What kind of kindness is this? What kind of graciousness is this? It's from another world, and it is. But the thing that we, met, we miss is how hard it was for the king. How hard it is for the person who has been offended to actually forgive, because here's what forgiveness is. It, it, it's releasing the other person, but at great expense to you. See, see, Forgiveness is never free. Forgiveness always costs somebody something. And so what forg- if, if you walk out of a restaurant and beat the check, right? You, you didn't just get a free meal. The restaurant had to absorb the cost of that particular thing. Somebody is always absorbing the cost when, for, when forgiveness is needed and when forgiveness is granted. And the king has absorbed this cost. The king has signed up for some pain that they didn't deserve because now he was going to have to figure out how do I stabilize the economy in my kingdom? It's going to take me great time. It's going to take me great effort. Forgiveness is hard. Unforgiveness is easy. And that's the next part, right? He says, and the guy goes out, you know, he's been forgiven of this, this huge debt, and he runs into a guy on the street. He's just been forgiven, like, just like a second ago, just like, just like, just right away, walks out of the steps of the palace, runs into one of his, one of his friends. His friends owes him three months wages. That's what the amount is here. I mean, that's not a small amount, right? Like, if you beat somebody for three months wages, that, that's a hurt on people. Most people can't recover from losing three months' wages. But comparatively speaking, right? Comparatively speaking, what this guy owes to this servant is nothing in comparison to what the servant, what the minister of finance owed to the king. And so what does he do? He does the easy thing. He grabs him by the throat. I like to say he goes Paulie Walnuts on the guy. You know, now I, you know I like Jesus. We got this Italian thing going on, me and him. You know, every story he tells got a little mob action going on. And he grabs him by, why the throat? I mean, that's, that's but gra- actually in Bible times, here's what it meant. You would grab him by the back of the collar. They allowed for vigilante justice in the Roman and Greek empire. And you were allowed to grab somebody and bring them off to court. You were allowed to do that. I guess it was their way of keeping government small in those days. And so what he does in society's eyes is the justifiable thing to do. Matter of fact, if all we had was the part of the parable that says, you know, this guy owed this, 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 his friend three months, serve, uh, three months wages, and he ran into him on the street, and the guy kept trying to duck him, and the guy was trying to dodge him, and so he grabbed the guy, and he took him to court to get his money back. Most of us would be like, yeah, he got what he's got coming to him, right? I mean, we agree with that, but when you put the rest of the story around it, it's like, what's wrong with this guy? See, forgiveness... It's hard. And, and it imprisons us. 
And that's what makes it even harder. Notice how the story ends. The story ends with the king taking the guy and, and, and turning him over to the torturers. And this is what unforgiveness does. It turns us over to the torturers, the torturer of lack of joy, the torturer of bitterness, the torturer of clouded thinking, the torturer of changing who we are, the torturer of giving other people permanent power over our life. And notice what the, what the king called the servant. He said, you wicked servant. And this doesn't mean like demonic. It's not, that's not like what wicked means here. The best way to describe the word wicked here is wicker furniture. Anybody have any wicker furniture, right? Wicker furniture, the way they do it is they take these long kind of narrow wooden reeds and they soak them in water so that they could bend them. And then after they bend them into the shape they want them to, when it dries, it remains permanently twisted in that position. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying what unforgiveness does, it twists you. It causes you to remain permanently twisted in a position that you weren't designed to be in. What unforgiveness does is unforgiveness stops you. Unforgiveness blocks you. Matter of fact, it ties you to your history so that you cannot fulfill your destiny. I think we all should be learners of history, but never tied to our history. Because if we get tied to our history, it prevents us from fulfilling our destiny. And this is what the Bible is full of. See, the enemy's game is to tie people to what has hurt them so they cannot fulfill the destiny that God has meant to heal them. And if you look in the scriptures, you see this, for instance, with Joseph. What did the enemy try to do? Tie him to the hurt of his brothers, the pain of his past, so he would never enjoy the palace that God had destined for him. What did he try to do to Jesus, even on the cross? He tried to get Jesus to call on legions of angels to come and rescue him and to lash out at the creation so that Jesus would not fulfill the destiny of being our redeemer, but Jesus didn't take the bait of Satan. He cried from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Why? Would not be tied to his history because he wanted to fulfill his destiny. What is God saying? God is saying we have to take the limits off. There's no such score. You don't get to at some point say, I don't forgive because here we go again. Because if you do, then that's how you and God are going to do relationship. And I don't know about you, I can't afford God to treat me that way. I'm a little less perfect than you are. You might be more perfect than me. You may not need forgiveness more than three times in life. But I know I need forgiveness sometimes more than three times in a day. I know sometimes I need forgiveness more than three times in a week. And I know that I can't afford it. And so I've got to have different relationship with God. The problem with forgiveness. So how do we overcome the problem? Well, we go to the second part of the parable, the prerequisite of forgiveness. And it's remember the cross. When it comes to forgiveness, the struggle is real with remembering because we remember more what they did and the pain that we experienced and the hurt that we cannot forget. And so we have, a tr we have trouble forgiving. But what if I told you that the key to forgiving or the key to forgetting is remembering to forget? Most people don't think remembering and forget go in the same sentence. But I'm here to tell you that if you remember what happened on the cross, if you remember what Christ did for you on the cross, that remembrance will push you to a place where you could forget, not in that it's washed from your memory, but that the sting of the situation is out of your heart and out of your mind so that you can release the other person so that God can do a work in their life. Listen to what the scripture says. And be kind to one another. Tender hearted. Well, why? Why? Why should I be kind? Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. 
Can I tell you where the power to forgive comes from? Can I tell you where the power to not block forgiveness out of your mind but release it from your heart comes from? It comes from remembering what Christ did for us. Just like the man in the story, we had a debt that we could not pay in a million lifetimes, but he for our sake paid that debt that he did not owe. Remember the cross, Jesus yelled, it is finished, paid in full. That's what he did on the cross. He canceled, Colossians says, canceled. He's the original canceler, by the way. By the way, Jesus cancels different than the world cancels. When the world cancels, it puts you into some type of purgatory, some type of living hell. It doesn't give you a second chance. When Jesus cancels, he sets you free. Come on. We need to cancel like Jesus cancels. We need to start letting people go. We need to start letting people off the hook. I know some of your sense of justice is being violated right now. I'm going there. Hold on. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross paid in full. You know the thing about God is God remembers in order to forget. Do we not believe for one minute God doesn't see everything we do? Do we not believe that in in the moments in which we are acting ungodly, willfully, I know you never willfully act ungodly, I know. I know you never have the Holy Spirit speak to your heart and say, don't do that and do it anyway. I know that's not you. I'm just talking. I'm going to preach to me today. Is it okay if I just preach to me? I want to get better just for me, okay? And and so I know that, that we never think we do, but it's not like God doesn't see everything that we do. Not like God doesn't see us right in the act. And then we try to play dumb with God. Oh, hey, God. You know, hey. But God remembers In order to forget, God remembers our name. He remembers our need. He remembers our tears. He remembers our kindness to others. He remembers our labor for him. And he remembers the cross in order to forget our sin. Jeremiah 31, verse 34, I'll wipe the slate clean for each of them. I'll forget they ever sinned. How is God able to do that? The cross, when he remembers that cross, he forgets our sin. It is the prerequisite for forgiveness and the power to give what to forgive what they've done to you it happens only when we remember that by comparison to what we've done to God. And see, here's our problem. We don't think we did anything bad to God. Our problem is we just don't think that we're as bad as they are. Because in our minds, we have sanitized sin. And so the sin that we have committed is not really bad, but the sin that they have committed is really, really bad. And what we don't understand is what sin is to God. Sin is what killed Jesus. Let me say it again. Sin is what killed Jesus. And I know I'm using the word killed kind of out of context because nobody really killed Jesus because Jesus laid down his life. So let me say it like this. Sin is what caused Jesus to go to the cross. Sin required the blood of Jesus. Sin required the payment of God's Holy One. Sin required the precious blood of Jesus. We have not been redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but by the precious blood of the Lamb. Sin is not okay. So stop comparing what you did is not bad to what they did that is really bad because in God's eyes, It really was bad. And when we look at what God has forgiven us of and we compare it to what God is asking us to forgive them of, it doesn't even measure up. So the power or the prerequisite to forgiveness comes when we remember the cross. And here's what happens when we remember the cross. We realize that justice was served. See, The problem with forgiveness or the difficulty with forgiveness is both a human and a theological problem. And that is the tension between mercy and justice. If we show mercy and forgive and the person just walks scot-free, our sense of justice is violated, albeit only when we are the one in the wrong. Did you catch that last part? Because when we do something wrong, we're not worried about justice. We are worried about one thing, only mercy. Matter of fact, when our kid does something wrong, we only want mercy 
for our kid, but when their kid does something to our kid or against our kid, we are not worried about mercy for their kid. Then we are going down to the school and demanding that justice be done for our kid. Like I'm preaching so good this morning, y'all just don't know what to say. (laughs) See, we have this sense of wanting what is right when we aren't the one who committed the wrong. But when we are the one who committed the wrong, we don't want what is right. We want what we don't deserve in this situation, which is mercy. And so there is this tension, let's face it, right, in every single situation that happens in life between mercy and justice. It is both a human problem and a theological problem. Numbers chapter 14 says it like this. The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgressions, but by no means clears the guilty. Uh Uh-oh, we got tension? Well, which one is it? Does God show mercy or does God give justice? Is he a loving God who forgives the guilty or is he a just God who punishes the guilty? Said another word, say another, said another way, God is a father but he's also a judge. Shall the judge give way to the father or the father give way to the judge? God has sworn that he has no pleasure in the death of a sinner yet he's also sworn that the soul of the sinner shall die. Which of the two oaths shall God keep? Shall one give way to the other? Will the real God please stand up? Will the God of justice stand up or will the God of mercy stand up? Can you see the tension between the two? You experience it in your own life. But the cross, but the cross is where both justice and mercy were granted. On the cross, God exacted full punishment and payment for sin and in the same moment provided mercy in the form of a complete and utter forgiveness for the guilty. On the cross, both the justice and the mercy of God fully cooperate with one another. Payment is made for sin, justice and mercy is provided for all. Romans 3 says that he might be both the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. The cross. The essence of sin is man substituting himself for God. The essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. In sin, man asserts himself to be God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. In salvation, God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. In sin, man claims prerogatives which belong only to God. In salvation, God accepts penalties which belong only to man. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. That was maybe a little bit too much because you should have been out of your seat and on your feet. We don't understand that it's not us that has to pay people back. That God is the judge. We are not the judge. And in the story, we have a servant who is living only at the mercy of a king putting himself in the place of a king when he refuses to forgive the person who has wronged him. When we refuse to forgive, we too are servants acting like kings and the only thing that will change a servant from acting like a king is to get a view of the amazing love of a king who became a servant. The cross. The cross is where justice and mercy came together. Justice and mercy made it and had a baby called grace. On the cross, there was a collision. And the collision was the justice of God, the fury of God, the righteousness of God, the judge of God, and the mercy of God, the fatherhood of God, the goodness of God, the love of God, and the two of them came charging toward one another. It was an epic collision. It was a clash of the ages. It was a conundrum for all of humanity, but when those two things hit each other, a baby was formed called the grace of Almighty God, and grace is what you and I do not deserve. It is the favor of God. See, when we remember the cross, we remember that's where grace was given. 
he went to the king, and the king said, your debt is canceled. No strings attached. Here's the problem. We don't really understand what grace is. We hear it all the time. We can quote it with our lips, but our life has not embraced it. We can say it is unmerited favor. It's God giving to me what I don't deserve. Mercy is God withholding from me what I do deserve. Thank God both mercy and goodness are following all, me all the days of my life. I thank God for that. But we hear it, but we don't understand it. And I believe that's what happened to this guy. He asked the king, give me more time. The king said, no, your debt is forgiven. It's discharged. No strings attached. He heard the words of the king, but in his heart, he still thought he had to pay it back. And because in his heart, he still thought he had to pay it back, here's what happened. When he came out, he was looking to recoup, not for himself, but to pay the king back. And so he thought, I know what I'm going to do. Ha, the king just forgave me. Here's how I'm going to repay the king's kindness. I'm going to throttle this guy. I'm going to beat him by, to a pope. I'm going to grab him by the throat. I'm going to go poly walnuts on him. I'm going to get my three months worth of wages, and I'm going to try to pay off 10,000 talents of debt. And here's why we don't release grace in the life of other people. Because even though we know, listen, listen, let me say it loud and proud. Canceled. No strings attached. Forgiven. Wiped clean. Doesn't remember them anymore. Yeah, but, but, but now I know I got to do this. And now I know. See, what you're doing is you're doing the right thing because you still think you're having to do it to earn the favor of the king. I don't do the right thing to earn the favor of the king. I do the right thing because I have received the favor of the king. It has nothing to do with God loving me more. It has to do with me loving God. And so we don't understand. And so we cannot Forgive, and God is saying in this parable, take the limits off. Remember what I've done for you in order to forgive what others have done to you. And then Jesus ends with this last point. He says, Pete, um, the third thing I want you to get is the power of forgiveness. And before we go into the specific part that Jesus shares with Peter, let me digress beyond the story to the preponderance of scripture so that you can see this truth. The power of forgiveness is that God repays. The power of forgiveness is that God repays. One of our favorite verses, churches, people, Christians have favorite verses. Usually the favorite verses are verses that they don't understand that seem like it's God doing what they want. Yes? No? I'm just, I'm preaching to myself again, forgive me. Romans chapter number 12, verse number 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Time does not permit me to delve into the entire meaning of this text, but let me just say, this is not the attack verse that we think it is. It is not the verse where we turn God into our personal pit bull. And we sit God on everybody who has done us wrong. That's really not with this verse. And so from that perspective, and again, I don't have time to deal with it all, let me focus on the word repay for a moment and, and, and tell you that at least part of the meaning of this word repay has more to do with the person that is wronged than it does with the person who is, does the wronging. That there is this concept of repayment in the Bible granted to those people who forgive. That indeed it sets into motion this uh, sovereign law of the universe where God is able to do for you what otherwise could not have been done if you offer forgiveness to the one who has harmed, harmed you. Matter of fact, does not the Bible say that God recompenses 
our wrongs. Isaiah chapter 61, verse number one, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Verse 7, instead of your shame, you shall have double honor, and instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. What does that say? So God's a recompenser. God is a repaying God. You know why we ought to forgive? Because if you forgive, you've taken your pound of flesh. You got your repayment. But I know something about God. He repays way better than I ever can. Even in the deviousness of my mind, even in those vengeful thoughts that cross my heart, and I've had many of them, trust me. I've had a lot of them. I remember one situation that was going on in life. A friend of mine who is not such a good guy looks over at me. He said, Pastor, you want me to take care of this? We could take care of this. And one full swoop, and we will never see that person ever again. And there was things going on in my mind. I was like, yeah. And nobody would blame me for it. But then I just stepped back and I said, God repays better than me. I said, God is going to give me double for this trouble. God is going to swoop in and God in, the, in his justice and God in his mercy and God in his great is going to do something in my life. Can I tell you that God wants to give you double for your trouble? The truth of the matter is anytime you are wrong, wouldn't it be great if you start seeing everything's about to double, double? Healing, about to double-double. Finances, about to double-double. Joy, about to double-double. Peace, about to double-double. It's about to double-double. Why? Because I trust in the power of forgiveness. The power for God to repay. Matter of fact, if you look all throughout the Bible, you realize that the reason why you can trust God to repay is because the truth of the matter is Whatever somebody does to you can never stop what God has for you. Let me say it loud. Whatever somebody does to you can never stop what God has for you. Joseph's brothers threw him into a pit. Joseph still wound up in the palace. Whatever somebody does to you can't stop what God has for you. Esther's parents were murdered in war. She was sold into slavery. She was a slave in a foreign nation with no way up and no way out, but she was beautiful. God made her for that reason. Look at your neighbor and say, don't hate me because I'm beautiful. God made me for that purpose, and she still wound up as queen. Why? Why? Because what God has for you cannot be stopped by what somebody does to you. They threw Daniel into a lion's den to kill him. Daniel still wound up as a governor and as an advocate or an advisor to the king. What they did to you cannot stop what God has for you. They threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into a fiery furnace. They came out and they still became governor over providences. Why what they do to you cannot stop what God has for you. The power of forgiveness. But guess who can stop it? You. You can stop it. Because the devil can't. They can't. But only you can. And that's if you choose to take Revenge into your hands. You know why? Because forgiveness is a test of power. You know what the church does well? We do weakness well. We know how to deal well with the weakness test. We go to God like the unforgiving servant. We beg for his mercy. We confess our sins which we should do. That's doing weakness well. Confessing your sins. 
but we don't do power well. Power is when you have the ability to repair and you choose instead to tear down. And any power that is not a repairing power, it's not a godly power. I could preach on that for a whole long time. Forgiveness is a test of your power. And here's the thing that I've realized about power is what God does in your life not only has to do with how you deal with weakness, but more importantly is how you deal with power. And here's why. Everybody is weak, but not everybody gets power. And so when you are privileged with power, you are more accountable to steward the power at a different level in order for God to use you in the way that God wants to use you. Notice what else he says. He says that the power of forgiveness comes in the form of God redeems. This is the second power of forgiveness. Do you remember in the Bible the story of Stephen? Stephen is being stoned to death. And as he's being stoned to death, he prays, Lord, do not hold this to their charge. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Jesus on the cross. In other words, he is choosing forgiveness even when his life is being threatened and ultimately taken from him. Yeah, but pastor, a lot of good it did him. He died. Yeah, but watch this. But he being full of the Holy Spirit gazed up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Yeah, but, but he died. Yeah, but he got a standing ovation in heaven. Yeah, but he died. Yeah, but he got a standing. Some of you would rather be elevated here than elevated there. Come on now. Some of you would rather be crowned here than crowned there. Some of you say that you're living for those words, good and faithful, so well done, good and faithful servant. But let's not play. Let's not front. We're not really living for that because if we were living for that, we wouldn't be so earthly minded. We would be more heavenly minded. We would keep our focus on things which are not below, but things which are above, where Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. I want more than I want anything else to see Jesus standing when I come to heaven. Is he, is he going to be standing for you? He stands up. And, and, and when I met, I might be wrong about this. There's a first time for everything. When I meditated on this, the Lord told me I didn't just stand to receive him I stood to hear his prayer. I, because he was operating in forgiveness, I wanted to know what was going to come next. And should he have said, Lord, rescue me? Remember Jesus on the cross? He said, Father, forgive them. But what if he said, Father, rescue me? He said himself, can I not call on 12 legions of angels right now and my Father who is in heaven will send them to... But it would have, abort it would have given him a victory, but he would have lost his destiny. Sometimes we've got to lose temporary fights in order to win permanent wars in life. And so he, he says, I stood... Because I was waiting, sort of like a parent. You ever see your kids like playing and you don't want to be that overly protective parent? And so you know like this could go wrong right here, right? Because you got that parental intuition. This could, go, this could go the wrong way. And so you stand up and you're ready. You're ready. And, and if you see it going off the rails, boom, there you are. But if you don't see it going off the rails, you like this. And so I believe when Jesus stood, he stood. Jesus was standing waiting, okay, what's going to be the prayer? Can I tell you, when you operate in forgiveness, he stands to be your advocate. He stands to be your defender. He stands to make sure the stones don't do what they're supposed to. He stands to protect you. He stands to make your path straight. Take the limits off God. Father, forgive them. Did, did he answer his prayer? Did he answer his prayer? Read the story. It says, Acts chapter 7, verse 58, the mob stoning Stephen laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, Saul consented to the death of Stephen. In other words, the member of the Sanhedrin who was ordering the stoning of Stephen 
was this guy by the name of Saul. Maybe you're familiar with him. Guess what he did? He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. I'm here to tell you that I believe Jesus answered his prayer. Just like he prayed it. Guess who was the answer to the prayer? It was Saul. Guess why Jesus showed up on the road to Damascus to meet a man that was killing the church because somebody decided that this was not going to be good for them, but it was going to be good for society. It was going to be good for the kingdom. It was going to be good for the world. And so he prayed, Father, forgive them. And Jesus met Saul on a road to Damascus forgave him and he wrote two thirds of the New Testament God redeems he redeems through forgiveness can I tell you you'll never know what somebody who's wrong can be until you've attempted to let God change them with your forgiveness But lastly, and by the way, did you know um, the way you overcome evil is with good? Matter of fact, that's exactly what the scripture tells us. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. I mean, history is replete with this. Desmond Tutu, a black South African who grew up under apartheid, insisted that without forgiveness, there is no future for South Africa. He rejected the Nuremberg trials model that was used in post-Nazi Germany in dealing with war criminals. That approach would have required a full trial and punishment for all the accused of violent crimes under the apartheid regimen. Instead, Tutu devised a plan that offered amnesty and forgiveness for any perpetrators of violence, black or white, who would come forward and publicly confess the full truth of what they had done during the prescribed years. While there were no civil penalties for confessors, the light of truth and knowledge made it possible for their society to move forward. There were natural consequences, moral and social, for the perpetrators. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission created opportunities for personal forgiveness to be extended and relationships to be restored. Bishop Tutu argued that the alternative to forgiveness in South Africa would have been the cycle of violence seen in the Balkans after the breakup of Yugoslavia. There's another famous wager of war against evil. The greatest evil that America has ever known, his name, of course, is MLK. And one of his famous quotes is this, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. We have slipped so far in our society from biblical truth that we wind up where we don't have system change hello Jesus said I'm not coming to raise the limits I'm coming to usher in a lifestyle I'm not coming to change the system I'm coming to alter the system do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good God redeems through forgiveness and lastly God restores and this is the third power of forgiveness and this is what Jesus was getting at when he talked to Pete Pete said, how often shall I forgive? Up to three times. He said, Jesus, I'm going to raise that to seven. Jesus looked at Peter, knowing the beginning from the end. He said, Pete, no, not three times, till the end of time. And here's the reason why, because Jesus knew there would come a time when the rule of law had Pete caught red-handed. The rule of law would have canceled his destiny for all of history. The rule of law would have wiped him off of the planet, never never having made a difference for God or his kingdom. Because there was a time in Peter's life where he didn't deny Christ once. He didn't deny Christ twice. He didn't deny Christ three times, but in one day, in one hour, He denied Christ three times. And he was grateful for this lesson. Had he not gotten this lesson, had Jesus had said, yeah, Pete, you know what? No, we can't change it. We're going to stick with three strikes and you're out. Peter would have never came back. His shadow would have never healed.
healed people. He would have never went on to be one of the founding apostles of the church. But because Jesus came and Jesus said, Pete, I want you to know that through forgiveness, I can restore. There are some of you that need some things restored in your life. Some of you need your marriages restored, your relationships with your kids restored, your heart restored, your mind restored. Some of you need to forgive some things and some people who you, you don't have any relationship with, who you can't do anything to change, but you need to forgive it because what it's doing is it's tying you to a history, preventing you from fulfilling your destiny. It's keeping you trapped. And Jesus said, I want to introduce you to a new lifestyle. It's not easy, but it is the best path forward. Can you say amen? Would you stand to your feet? Thanks for watching. We hope this message encouraged you. If you enjoyed today's message, be sure to like this video and share it with someone you know so that they too can be inspired. If you would also like to partner with us, click the link in the description below so you can continue to help us further the gospel. We invite you to join us again at one of our online experiences. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss a single video and live stream. Thank you again for watching. And remember, with Jesus, you are destined to win.